Hi little skeletons, it is Disney Queen Skelly here. Welcome back to the True Crime series. So today our true crime story is taking place in Colorado. So let's get into it. Colorado, Dave Cullen Columbine. The broad outlines of what happened at Columbine High School in Colorado are well known. Yet what's amazing is how much of Cullen's book still comes as a surprise. The end of the trench coat mafia. Had Dave Cullen Capitulated to cliche while writing Columbine, he would have started his tale 48 hours before Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold's notorious killing spree, stopped the frame just before they fired their guns, and then spooled back to the very beginning with the promise of trying to explain how the two boys got to this twisted past. But he doesn't. As Colin eventually writes, there had been no trigger, at least none that would be satisfying to, to horrified outsiders, grieving parents, or anyone in between. Eric Harris was a psychopath simple as that. Dylan Klebold was a suicidally depressed kid who yoked his fate to a sadist. Instead, what intrigues the author are perceptions and misperce misperceptions. How difficult a shooting spree is to untangle. How readily mass tragedies lend themselves to misfortune and mytholo mythologizing. How psychopaths can excel at the big con. The broad outlines of what happened at Columbine High School in Colorado one decade ago are well known. On April 20th, 1999, just weeks from graduation, Harris and Klebold murdered one teacher and 12 of, the, 12 of their peers, making this the most lethal high school massacre in the nation, and wounded two dozen. Then they hold up in the school library and turn their guns on themselves. Yet what's amazing is how much of Colin's book still comes as a surprise. I expected a story about misfits exacting vengeance because that was my memory of the immediate consensus. Columbine Wright, wasn't there something going on there between goths and jocks? In fact, Harris and Klebold were killing completely at random that day. Their victims weren't the intended targets at all. The entire school was. Columbine, it turns out, was a failed attempt at domestic terrorism. Shortly after 11.14 a.m., the two boys hauled a propane bomb into the cafeteria programmed to go off at 11.17. It never did. Had the massacre gone as planned, it would most likely have killed more than 500 people, yielding far less readily to, to rumors about high school's trivial poli tribal politics. To his credit, that Colin, a Denver journalist who covered the story for Salon and State, makes the reader care about getting it right. Columbine is an excellent work of media criticism, showing how legends become truths through continual citation. A sensitive guide to the patterns of public grief, foreshadowing many of these same reactions to September 11th. Lawsuits, arguments about the memor memorial, voyeuristic bus tours, and at the end of the day, a fine example of old-fashioned journalism. While Cullen's storytelling doesn't approach the novelistic beauty of In Cold Blood, an unfair standard perhaps, but an unavoidable comparison for a murder story thus detailed. He writes well enough, moving things along with agility and grace. He leaves us with some unforgettable images, like the pizza slices floating aimlessly about the school commons, which was flooded with three inches of water because the sprinkler system had gone off, and he has a knack for the thumbnail sketch. He was a shrink-turned-hostage negotiator-turned-detective with an abridged version of the complete works of Shakespeare in the backseat of his car, Colin writes of Duane Fusilier, an FBI agent and one of the book's heroes. He could be a little stoic, hugging his sons felt awkward, but he would reach out to embrace survivors when they needed it. Fusilier is one of the people Colin spotlights in his retelling in order to clear up the historical record. Some of the confusion generated by Columbine was inevitable. Harrison Klebold started out wearing trench coats, for instance, but at some point removed them, giving the illusion that they were four people rather than two. The homemade pipe bombs they were tossing in all directions down stairwells onto the roof only seemed to further the impression that there were more of them. And then there were the SWAT teams. Students trapped inside the building would hear their rifle fire, assume it was the killers, and report it to the media by cell phone, compl complicating the cops' efforts to keep them safe. This was the first major hostage standoff of the cell phone age, Colin notes. The police had never seen anything like it. But the most subtle distor distortions of the media echo chamber, it seems, did not concern logistics. They concerned motive. As early as two hours into the live coverage of Columbine, news stations began to report that something called the Trenchcoat Mafia, a group of disgruntled goths, has, was possibly it behind the attack. Many of the students watching this coverage on classroom televisions while still trapped inside the building began to repeat this information to reporters on the outside once they had escaped. And it made sense. The killers were wearing trench coats. And so a loop began, reinforced by four eyewitnesses, 
who said the gunmen were deliberately targeting their victims. One offered such a precise level of detail. The killers were taking aim at anyone of color wearing a white hat or playing a sport. That it proved irresistible both to students and to members of the media who, Colin speculates, were out of their element in this teenage universe and therefore willing to repeat this rumor. Whether their witnesses and had seen the gunmen or not, reporters, the author points out, would not make that mistake at a car wreck. Of course, tragedies often lend themselves to miss, so as to meet the needs of the day. For weeks after September 11th, the, no the lovely legend persisted that the Reverend Mitchell Judge, a New York Fire Department chaplain, died from falling debris when, a when he took off his helmet to give last rites to a firefighter. As I wrote sometime later in New York Magazine, that's not how he died. But people had a stake in that belief, a col and Columbine generated a similar tale of spiritual matrodome. A boy who witnessed the murders in, school li in, school in the school library told people afterward that a slain student, a fellow evangelical named Cassie Bernal, was asked by one of the killers if she believed in God. Yes, I believe in God, he said she, re he, said she replied. Two other witnesses, both sitting near Cassie, heard no such thing. And Colin goes on to say that a 911 tape from the day proved conclusively that she hadn't uttered these words. It didn't matter. The story caught the imagination of the evangelical world, and Cassie's mother, Misty Bernal, wrote a book. She said yes, that has since sold more than one million copies. Columbine is weakest when Colin tries to channel the voice of Eric Harris. Five or six hundred dismemberments ought to be enough for one awesome afternoon of TV is one such example. As the author, author himself makes clear, Harris's mind is in a particularly interesting place to inhabit, just sneering and young and unfathomably angry. But his nuanced dissection of the differences between Harris and Klebold is first rate, leaving readers in the strange and challenging position of feeling pity, almost for Klebold. Colin walks us carefully through the de definition of psych psychopathy and how it differs from insanity, noth nothing, how, nothing, how perfectly Harris met the profile, particularly in his in egomania, outsized contempt for humanity and the talent for manipulation. Just months before the attack, a teacher wrote on one of his essays, I would trust you in a heartbeat. Whereas Klebold, for most of the book, seems forlorn, awkward, and miserable. The anger and the loathing, Colin explains, traveled inward. In case you're wondering, we don't get the granular details of Harrison Klebold's last 48 hours until the end of the book. When we know so much more, it's almost beside the point, which isn't to say some of the testimony still isn't chilling. That Sunday, in a homemade videotape, Harris addressed his parents. They could not have stopped him, Eric assured them, Colin writes. He quoted Shakespeare, Good wombs have borne bad sons. Alright guys, and that is it for today's true crime story. I actually, unfortunately, know someone who knew someone who was in the school when the shooting happened and it had taken a major toll on their family. And I could never imagine what it was like to be in their shoes when they saw it happen. All I can really say to the family that I, I've known for years is I'm so sorry for what happened and, you know, I know it'll never get easier. But if you guys have more details on what happened during Columbine, if you maybe know someone who was in the school, or if you have more details that I did not rehear, please leave them in the comment section down below. My thoughts and condolences are always with the family members of the teacher, and not only that, but the students who were involved as well. Thoughts and prayers go out to the family as well as the students, whether they uh, lost their lives or were injured or were just involved in general. It, it's unfortunate that things like this happen around the world and hopefully one day it doesn't happen to be a problem anymore. So thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see y'all next time. Bye little skeletons, stay safe, and I love you guys.